the boys back by popular demand on FanDuel TV. Of course, on the Ringer Gambling Show, it is East Coast Bias. Joe House, Raheem Palmer, live from Los Angeles. I, John Jastrzemski, just back from Los Angeles. We have a lot to dissect. We'll get to the full court of NFL football games. I need to uh, get that bad taste out of my mouth from what happened last Sunday and Monday. And listen, I don't think I'm allowed in Los Angeles because anytime I go to Los Angeles, my football teams and my bets do nothing but lose. So maybe I got to put some voodoo and sprinkle some sage or something the next time I step foot in the state of California. But let's get to the basketball right out of the gate. Raheem, we'll get to your experience at the Staples for the Lakers-T-Wolves game. House, game one, Celtics-Knicks, Lakers-T-Wolves. We don't want to jump to conclusions one game out of 82. Here's the takeaway I have, though. The Timberwolves and the Knicks were two outstanding teams from a year ago. They made a monstrous trade. They have a different look to them. I would come to the conclusion that at least for the first month, maybe even the first four to six weeks, I think we're going to see some growing pains. I think it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period for those two teams. I know the Celtics shot it great. I know they were lights out, but you got new pieces, Bridges, Pounds, Bridges working on his jumper, Minnesota trying to see what their rotation is going to look like. Do you think it will take them that long, or am I kind of on the right time frame with the adjustment period for both the Knicks and the Timberwolves right out of the shoot. Yeah, I think you're dead on the money, JJ, and I'm not going to overreact either. I still really think that the Knicks team in particular is built for it, and over the course of this very long regular season in the NBA, we'll pull it together. The key thing for them is health. If they can keep their guys upright for most of the season, I think they're going to be Right there, I'm not worried about their chemistry experiment. I was really disappointed in Minnesota, though. I will tell you right now. I thought that Minnesota really just showed a lack of enthusiasm. I don't know how to put it otherwise. They looked dead, and Dream was in the building. Maybe he can give us his review live from from seeing it with his own two eyes. I just don't – for sure, it's fine to anticipate there being – a little bit of of a process in working in Julius Randle and working in DDV. Uh, Julius had like, you know, 34 minutes and DDV had like 31 minutes. Um, And Julius, you know, shot 50% from the floor and had a decent number of, of rebounds, but there was just no pep in their step. They didn't defend with any kind of intensity. And that was a, a bummer to me dream. I think the big thing with Minnesota is they turned the ball over a ton. Like you look at that, like the full game, they had 16 total turnovers. So when you're turning the ball over that much, it's very difficult to get back in defense and stop anybody. And at the end of the day, they lost by seven points. And Anthony Davis had one of his best regular season games we've seen in five years. We know Anthony Davis is one of the best players in the league, but he picks and chooses when he's going to show up. He's often injured. He just had a monster game. And you look at the fact that they were implementing new pieces. Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, Mike Conley may not be what he was. To me, I don't, I'm not hitting the panic button on the Minnesota Timberwolves. But as far as the New York Knicks, they built this team to stand up to the Boston Celtics. And they got absolutely taken into the deep waters and drowned. Like, that game was not close at all. And, you know, I gave out a pick on Twitter. I gave out the Boston Celtics minus five and a half. You know, the last 13 ring nights. Those teams are 11-2 and two against the spread. So I knew the Boston Celtics would come back. This is one of the rare teams, and I mean absolutely rare teams in any sport, that comes back with a chip on their shoulder after winning a championship because we saw how Jason Tatum and we saw how Jalen Brown were treated this summer. So I think this Boston Celtics team is a juggernaut, but the Knicks are going to have to do something to put it together. Yeah, listen, Raheem, I- I'm with you. And I thought Boston was the play last night. I thought it was a brutal spot for the Knicks. Everything you kind of illustrated as far as these teams that hoist the banner and the success usually in that night, you know, the vibes kind of continue no matter how the season's going to go. How I think the other narrative was, hey, the Celtics have been hearing all offseason, not only the Olympic stuff with Brown and Tatum, but all the Knicks are going to be your biggest challenge. All the Knicks, they they got knocked off by Indiana and it was due to injury and they might have given you a series in the Eastern Conference Finals. I almost feel as if from a motivational standpoint, It was the double whammy for Boston going into that first game. And with the Knicks having some flux now with the roster and trying to figure out what's what, 
I kind of think it was an impossible spot for them. It really was. You're you're absolutely right. And it's why on East Coast Bias on this very podcast Monday, I gave out the Boston Celtics handler business at five and a half and then dream doubled down on it. And on that very same podcast, dream told everybody play the Baltimore Ravens in the first half. And then I live tweeted that stuff. Y'all better be listening to East Coast Bias. We're trying to put some money in your pockets right here. But yes, going back to the Celtics, JJ, of course. They did what you want the champ to do. It's our champ. We got the bet. You see that banner right there? It just went up in the rafters. That's us. That team is absolutely from top to bottom on the same page. Coach Missoula's in his bag. They came out and we're going to do, we're going to, put up 61 threes. Is this how the Celtics are going to get down this season? The Celtic boogie is going to be 60 threes a game. Well, if they make half of them, it's going to be awfully hard. The math is not in favor of any other team in the NBA. So all credit to the Celtics. They came up loaded. They're like, you know, if you come for the crown, you best not miss. Well, the Knicks have to start building (laughs) <laughs> up quickly to get into the class of the Celtics. The Celtics demonstrated again that they are the class of the league until further down the stream. Not only are they the class of the league, you look at FanDuel Sportsbook right now, they're plus 310 to win the NBA Finals and plus three, um, plus 155 to win the Eastern Conference. I think you need to find a way to get that in your portfolio because they're going to be in the mix. And maybe it's tying it in with an NFL future like and you can have a little fun throughout the winter months and then maybe carry that over into the spring. Speaking of having a little fun and speaking of having something that I am carrying now into the fall on that note, Raheem, back in the springtime, I thought it'd be a good idea to go and take the Boston Celtics to win the title. And I said, there's no value in this, right? Because they were the favorites. We all expected them to go and bring it home. But I said, let me parlay this sucker with the Yankees to go and win the World Series. I got like 15-1 to 1 riding now on the Yankees in the marquee World Series matchup that has me drooling, that has America drooling. It's going to be the highest-rated World Series, I think, in the last 20 years. Otani and Judge and Mookie and Soto. I'm drooling thinking about it already, Dream. And you know what I love about this matchup? As the FanDuel Sportsbook odds have the Dodgers with home field advantage, Getting ready for game one on Friday night. A very slight favorite in the minus 122 range. You've seen it in some places at minus 120. You know, normally Raheem, for my Yankees, when they're in the World Series, they're the favorites. Everyone is expecting them to win. I love the idea that the Yankees go into this World Series. A little bit of an underdog here, Dream. I like it, buddy. I'm not going to lie. I like it. Why do you like that? Because it's it's refreshing. You know what I mean? Okay. House, like for my entire life, and this goes for years where the Yankees got picked off and I didn't even love the team, there's this sort of tax, right, that you normally pay for the Yankees being in the World Series. Well, that tax goes out the window when the other team that's playing is the Los Angeles Dodgers with all their star power and all of their cachet. So, yes, House, I like the fact that the Yankees – I'm the underdog in this series. I do. Well, I, I want Dream to handicap it a little bit for me because I have a lean, but I haven't committed to a side. But I have two things to say, JJ. First of all, you did absolutely the right thing. Get the hell out of Los Angeles with your bad L.A. mojo. The only thing the- I will say, though, House, to my bad <laughs> mojo, the only thing I would say, I did see the quencher with my main man, Stefan, you did. You at did. the Shellback Tavern. True. And you know what? If you would have told me on Saturday night, I'd get that moment with Judge with Soto, and well, I should say with Stanton and Soto, and the Yankees would go and win the game, I would have taken losing every single NFL bet. <laughs> so just got to throw that out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I would say, please hedge. If you have 50, if you're sitting on a 15 to 1 ticket, take a small hedge. Don't do a big one. Just take a small hedge. Make, make it feel like you're, 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 it's a win win. Give yourself a win win right now, JJ. So here's the thing, Raheem, with the way I think this series is going to go. I do not think this will be an easy series for either team. I think it has six or seven games written all over it. I just, I have that sense. I have that vibe. I'm almost hoping, Dream, that I can get the Yankees up maybe two games to one in some Dream scenario at some point to get a better number on a hedge. Is that crazy or not necessarily? 
I don't think that's crazy at all. I like I, see the the problem I'm having with this series is that the 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 Dodgers don't have the pitching, and it just feels like they're surviving by slugging their way through the postseason. And we all know that pitching wins the postseason; it wins World Series. I think the Yankees have the better pitching, but. Their bullpen is a little suspect to me as well. And you saw it in that Cleveland series. It felt like Cleveland was just, you know, a swing of the bat, a two away from tying that series. And so this series is really tougher for me than any other series that I've seen in, in recent memory. So I would probably just, you know, play it game by game. And I definitely think you should hedge. I think House has the best advice. So I think the key to the series, guys, and Raheem hit at this. The Yankee rotation has got to be better than the Dodger rotation. And it starts with the guy who's pitching in game one, that house they paid a gazillion dollars to. I think in order for the Yankees to win this series, Garrett Cole has got to be the man. He's got to be automatic in these starts because the Dodgers don't really have their version of Garrett Cole. Yamamoto can only go five innings. Jack Flaherty is not an ace. Garrett Cole, to me, has got to be the difference maker. And you want X Factor, Nesta Cortez coming back. The old starter pitching out of the bullpen with Otani and Freeman and Muncie and all those lefties, that could help that overtaxed janky bullpen that I'm talking about. So I obviously have my heart talking here. I'm not going to be surprised either way. I mean, to me, the series price at minus 122 tells you all you need to know, and I'm not picking the Dodgers. Sorry. I mean, listen, if you think Mr. New York, New York is picking the Dodgers in the World Series, you got another thing coming. But how are you going to play this house? Uh, I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to, we're on our text thread. We have plays every, every night. I'm looking at so the we'll pitching play matchups. Nightly. I'll tell yeah, you we are. I'm going to tell you one thing I will we're do. We're taking the Yankees. We're taking yeah. Cole in I'm game gonna tell one. You, no, I'm not taking the Yankees in game one. Oh, you're not. And I, I know it sounds crazy. And, you know, this has nothing to do with math. This is more from a casual fan perspective. We all know for Fernando Valenzuela, he, he passed the other day. Yes, he did. May God, the stadium's going to be rocking on Friday night. I, I can't, I cannot fade that. Wow. I, 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 I just can't. And I don't know what that means. Obviously, that has nothing to do with analytics and nothing to do with, you know, serious level betting. But just from a casual perspective, I don't want to fade the Dodgers in that environment on Friday night. I don't. I, I, I understand that. I and understand Flaherty that. just had one of his worst starts of the year. Flaherty. It's He's weird. got Flaherty is coming off a start where he stunk against the Mets. But remember, he shut out the Mets in game mm -hmm. one and was nasty and was lights out. I want to throw this in quickly before we get to some football stuff. World Series MVP. Guys, remember I said this. I know he won the LCS MVP. John Carlos Stanton. He is a California boy. He loves the big stage. He loves October. And he's done nothing but mash this entire postseason, Raheem. So, like, from a Yankees standpoint, that's somebody I'm looking at. And from a Dodgers standpoint, Max Muncy. Max Muncy, I think, mm -hmm. is going to give the Yankees fits. He's lefty. Remember, you go to Yankee Stadium, so you're going to have that short porch so a lefty can go and take advantage. For me to come on and say, oh, I'm giving you Otani and Judge to be MVP, like, uh, any in America can do that. So I'm giving you two. One that's not off the beaten path. One that is. Stanton and Muncy, I'm playing both for MVP. What, what do those pay out? I'm just curious. Uh, the Muncy one is crazy. The Stanton one is not as – I think I saw Stanton around plus 750. Okay. Which makes sense because the Yankees are dogs. You're going to have Otani, you're going to have Judge, uh, and you're going to have Soto ahead of them. So uh, I'm going to finalize those. I'll get you the official pricing on that before the end of the show. FanDuel actually has hits leaders up here, and I think it's interesting because they have Stanton 65-1 to 1 to be the hits leader. See, the problem with Stanton getting hits, number one, they pinch run them late in games if the game is closed, so I don't like that. And he might go one for three or one for four, but if it's a big fly Raheem, you know, like the – the, the bets and the Glaber Torres of the world, to me, they're more likely to go and get. Who's, who's the leader for hits? It's got to be bets, right? Tommy Edmond at plus 200, followed by Mookie Betts at plus 240. Obviously, okay, Soto walks a lot, so he's at that 12 to 1. But I, I always think it's always one, it's always a guy who kind of sneaks through the cracks. <laughs> And that's what's great about the month of October. Next week, we'll reassess and reconvene when this series, hopefully, is going back to Chavez Ravine with the Yankees up 3-2. to two. And who knows? If it's up 3-2 mm -hmm. and the Yankees have a chance to clinch, you may see me for the Ring of Sunday pregame uh, back in Los Angeles next week. So there's a little food for thought. All right, guys, speaking of football, DeAndre Hopkins, a Kansas City Chief. House, move the needle. 
doesn't move the needle for you. It moves the needle. Of course it moves the needle. He is a top caliber. Once that's in your DNA, it doesn't go away. You might lose half a step, but he is now immediately in going to be in perfect harmony with Patrick Mahomes. The one thing I can say about DeAndre Hopkins is that throughout his entire career, it doesn't matter who he's playing quarterback with, he produces. Last year with Will Levis, he has 75 catches for 100, for 1,057 yards. So if you put him with Patrick Mahomes, he's going to produce. Now, if you look at pro football focuses, separation metrics, he's you know pretty much middle of the pack. But he doesn't need to separate with his length and his hands. And Patrick Mahomes, even though he's throwing a ton of interceptions this year, He's going to be able to put the ball where it is. Having an extra weapon is going to be great for the Kansas City Chiefs. And you can bet on this. DeAndre Hopkins, at some point, is going to have a monstrous reception or touchdown for Kansas City, whether it's against Buffalo, whether it's against Baltimore, or who knows? Maybe it's down in New Orleans again in the Super Bowl. We'll have to wait and see on that one. We got a lot more coming your way in this loaded East Coast bias. We had a lot of... Paperwork, we had to take care of early. NBA's back, we got a World Series, but now we turn our attention fully to the National Football League. We got a Thursday night matchup. I think it's an interesting Thursday night game. Do the Rams have a new lease on life? Are the Vikings about to regress or was last week an anomaly against maybe the best team in the NFC? We got takes, we got thoughts, we got picks. Thursday night, good game. Can't wait to break it down. We'll come right back. Welcome back. We got a Thursday night game, which I am fired up for, by the way. It will be the Minnesota Vikings going to Los Angeles to take on the Rams. Looks like Cooper Cup is going to give it a go. Vikings, weird game. Weird, weird game last week against Detroit. Jumped out early. Looked like they were going to lose comfortably. Then they came storming back. But the Vikings go and lose to the Detroit Lions. And now you want to see how they respond. Tough spot on the road Thursday night. I'm having a hard time with this game, House, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I've been out on the Rams, right? I've been out on the Rams all year. I bet them as an under. I bet them to miss the playoffs. And for what it's worth, I feel pretty good about those wagers, despite some guys coming back. I don't don't think they have the look, they have the feel of a playoff team. I just don't like this spot at all for Minnesota. You're coming off an emotional division game. You have a short week. You got to go on the road. And they're a small favorite in the game. Like, this just reeks of house. Stay away, stay away, stay away. And we're not going to do that because we want to give the people what they want, which is winners. And we're going to try to find a way to handicap this bad boy. But I'm not going to lie, guys. I do not feel great about laying it with the Minnesota Vikings in this spot. And it, I'm going to play this game. I'm going to be on the Rams or I'm passing. That's the way I look at this spot. I hate it for Minnesota. JJ, I think your instincts are absolutely on the money. And what I did, one thing that was interesting to me, I wanted to go back over the course of this season and look at teams the week after they play Detroit. Because all of these Detroit games have been physical, emotional. Playing Detroit takes a toll on teams. Well, let me go through this and share with you what, what this shows. Week The Rams started off their season against Detroit. They, that game went to overtime. Really fun game. We enjoyed it. You know what they did in week two? They went and played the Arizona Cardinals and had their butts handed Got to them. Got smoked. I remember. I had 41 Arizona. 41 to 10. 41 to 10. Week th- three. Detroit plays the, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, Tampa, to their credit, they come in, handle their business. What happens the next week? Tampa goes home and gets smoked. By the Denver Broncos. Bo Nix goes into Tampa and smokes the Bucks. Week four, the Cardinals. They 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 come off of you know a rel- a game where the <laughs> Detroit handled them okay. Uh they go home, the Cardinals, they lose to the Seawards 42 to 14. A full-on butt whooping. The Seahawks the next week. They lose. They, they come off their game, a tough game against uh, uh, Detroit. They try, you know, that's a track meet game. That's Seattle-Detroit game. Seattle comes home. They lose to the Giants. And now we don't, we, we can't look at Dallas because uh, Detroit goes into Dallas and works Dallas and Dallas is off a of bye week. But what that tells you when you go through that list and you look at the outcomes, it, it takes a toll on a team to play Detroit. And this short week for Minnesota, 
is a is a, is just got you know trap written all all over it. The Rams are getting back Cooper Cup. Cup it seems the Rams are getting back their offensive line and Joe Nopum and. The Vikings look like they will be without their lead uh, tackler, their linebacker Cashman, another week. Well, they felt the 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 impact of Cashman not being on the field against Detroit. Detroit rushed for 140 yards without Mr. Cashman out there. So I think this one is is Rams or, or nothing dream, and I might be on the money line. So I actually have another trend, and I'm I'm glad House brought up all the trends about the Detroit Lions because. The Detroit Lions snapped the Vikings' undefeated streak, so they gave them their first loss. Now, if you go back in history and look at teams who suffered their first loss after Week Six, they are just thirty-two and forty-two against the spread. And if you, you know, you you get more granular and you take that subset and you just apply it to Thursday night football, teams in that situation after losing their first game are six and ten straight up and five and eleven against the spread since 1990 so a lot of times when teams suffer that first loss it's like oh wow they got exposed and you know one of the things that got exposed was the fact that Brian Flores he likes to send that blitz well we saw Jared Goff eat it for lunch guess who else eats it for lunch Matthew Stafford Matthew Stafford has a better EPA play and success rate when he's blitz versus when he's not blitz. So if he has Cooper cut back and he has Sean McVay, he's going to be able to dominate this defense. So I think this this is a good matchup for the Los Angeles Rams. And then also when you look at Sean McVay, he's 13 and six against the spread on short rest, covering four in a row and nine and one against the spread in his last 10 games in this spot. So the Rams are coming off a bye. The Vikings, they, they're they playing on a short week, emotional game against the Lions. Now you got to pick yourself up after your first loss. I think they might have two losses in a row. Well, remember, Rams beat the Raiders, uh, Raheem, last week. But it might as well be a bye. Uh, yeah, it might as well be a bye. About that. <laughs> so I, I kind of see where you're going with that. And I'm still yeah. salty, by the way, about the Rams not getting that cover. It seems like a united front here. Rams or pass is the way I think all three of us look at this particular Thursday night game. Uh, on the number, Raheem, it's a three at the moment on FanDuel. Is that a number you think is locked by kickoff? Should I maybe wait it out to try to get that half point? Like, how, how do you see that line moving? Or you see maybe going the other way? I think it's going to go back and forth. I think you're going to have some books have it at three. Some books have it at three and a half. I think the public's going to be all over the Vikings. And one thing we know about Thursday night football is that those road favorites, I mean, they they dominate. The, the, the favorites on Thursday night football, they tend to dominate. So the public's going to be all over that. And if you look at the last two weeks, road favorites are 16-2 and two against the spread. Yeah, so the public's going to be all over the Vikings. But I think the Sharps, the professional betters, the guys who grab numbers, they're going to be all over the Rams. So it's going to be a little bit of a, a tug, of, tug of war here. As far as the total is concerned, it opened at 45 and a half. House, it's all the way up to 48. You think we have points in this game? I don't, but I don't have a feel for um, you know, that 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 short week can can wreak havoc. You can get see points just, you know, falling from the sky. So I, I kind of don't want to mess with a Thursday night total. Raheem. So my model has this going under, but you gotta remember that doesn't include Cooper Cup. And Cooper Cup changes everything. And I I like how said I don't have a feel for this one at all. All right, so we're staying away from the total. And as far as Thursday night football is concerned, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, those road favorites have been kicking butt. And taking names, not this particular Thursday. Rams, we like it. Rams are passed. A lot more coming your way here in this edition of East Coast Bias. We will get to, I think, a very telling game between two teams that had championship aspirations at the start of the year, have not necessarily played like championship teams. One has a better record than the other. I think the point spread is rather telling in this game. We have a bunch of matchups to break down, and we'll start it off when we come back with Cincinnati and Philadelphia. East Coast Bias Boys, just getting started. We'll be right back. All right, boys, let's get to Philly and Cincy. This line is actually falling. It's now down to Cincinnati minus two, opened at three. There were a lot of two and a halfs early in the week. Philly is four and two, but yet I don't know what to make of the Eagles with their record, Raheem, because... They did not look great against Cleveland, but by the same token, they should have beaten the Atlanta Falcons. So I guess y'all are what y'all are, and they find a way to have a winning record despite Jalen Hurts not being where he was a few years ago and with Philadelphia not being the same team in the trenches. 
that they've been, despite all the sacks they had against the Giants, that to me far more about the Giants and the issues on the offensive line without Andrew Thomas, but be that as it may. Then you have Cincinnati. We know what the MO with the Bengals is. They're a tremendous offensive team. Their defense leaves a lot to be desired. I am not going to say their defense found it when they were playing Deshaun Watson and whatever the mess is going on with the Cleveland Browns. House, I see this game, though, and from a desperation standpoint, I think there will be far more desperation on the side of Cincinnati in this game. I can tell you confidently, there is no way in the world I am betting Philadelphia in this spot. If I am betting this game, I will be on Cincy or I'm not taking the game. Where do you stand on Bengals-Eagles? I, I'm in, in alignment with you on this one, uh, JJ. It is, uh, one, once again, you know, a season impacting season trajectory. How are the Bengals going to make it to the playoffs impact kind of, of game? And we just haven't seen Jalen Hurts um, play great yet this season. Uh, and, and to me, I'm going to handicap this looking at just, just comparing the, the quarterbacks, because I, I think the weapons uh, at, at receiver and, and quarterback is a, is a fair enough way of putting this into a side-by-side -side position. And yes, the Bengals have been uh, a, a messed up defense, but they, they, it looks like there were cluster injuries, you know, as the, the season's coming along on the defensive line. And maybe you're going to say that they're healthier, uh, up front now. Um, but really to me, it's, it's Jalen hurts. It's Jalen hurts on the road. Um, let me have Joe Burrow and, and these weapons. I think it, we're, that that's the correct side dream. So this one's interesting because both of these teams have actually played the exact same teams recently. They played the giants. The Bengals were laying three, three and a half. The Eagles played the giants. They were laying three, three and a half. So, Earlier this week, you saw the Bengals were at minus two and a half point favorites. That line has actually come down to minus one and a half. So the market is telling us that these teams are evenly matched, except for Cincinnati's at home. And if you look at their records, the Eagles are four and two, Pythagorean expectation of three and a half wins. The Bengals are three and four, Pythagorean expectation of 3.8 wins. So you have two evenly matched teams which are playing in Cincinnati. And I do think the Bengals are more desperate, obviously, but there's no real way to quantify that. I think the way to approach this game is to play the total. I don't think either one of these teams are stopping each other offensively. I think this this total opened up at 46 and a half. We gave it out on East Coast Bias over 46 and a half. I still would take it at 47 and a half where it is now. I think both of these offenses get off here. The one thing I did notice about the Philadelphia Eagles is that They've really struggled with slow starts. They have yet to score in the first quarter all season long. They have zero points in the first quarter, and they're 0-6 against the spread in the first quarter. Now, we're saying that right now on FanDuel TV. That's likely to change. I don't want to put the kibosh or the jinx on it, but I had to let you guys know. But I think there's going to be a lot of points in this game. Maybe the Eagles finally score in the first quarter. That's a classic don't kill the messenger, Raheem. We're not going to do that if it – puts the kibosh on it. You're just sharing information and sharing data for all the ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls who are watching the show and are listening to the show. So there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Buffalo and Seattle. Fascinating game, Raheem. Buffalo dominated the Tennessee Titans, got off to a slow start. Cousin Sal, when we were watching all the games at the uh, Spotify offices, uh, was in my ear saying, should we take minus 130 to win? We should have because it was a gift from the high heavens. And I basically said, nah, I don't want free money. I'm going to pass on it. But now you got them traveling to the West Coast. Seattle is coming off a big win against the Atlanta Falcons. They needed it. It was kind of a, a big pick-me-up for them after kind of hitting the skids over the last few games. This is a very, very tough game. My instinct is Buffalo's the better team. They're the more complete team. And I expect Josh Allen to have his way with that Seattle defense. But then you throw in the travel, you throw in the fact that Buffalo, if they get off to a slow start in this game, it's not going to be a repeat of what we saw with Tennessee. I'll start with you on this one, Dream. Buffalo, Seattle, Bills laying three. Where do you stand? This is a very tough game for me because I came in initially wanting to take Seattle, and then DK, Mac DK Metcalf got hurt. And when he got hurt, that changes everything for me because – Obviously, he's a big part of their passing offense. And I think they're going to need to keep up with this Bills offense with, with Josh Allen. You look at the Seahawks. They don't have a great defense. 
Like the Seahawks defense is much worse than what we saw from the Titans. The Titans are like 10th in EPA per play. The Seahawks were like 30th. So I actually think the Bills could find some success here with James Cook, like on the ground. I think they could find like look at Jordan, look what Jordan Mason did. He like he ran all over the Seahawks defense. So I think the Bills are gonna be able to score in this matchup, but I don't like the spot for the Bills at all. Like you play that emotional game on Monday night football against the New York Jets. Then you come back and you're down 10 nothing against the Tennessee Titans. And now you got to fly all the way to Seattle and you're laying points. I just don't like the spot at all. But I just I wanted to take Seattle, but DK is hurt. So I'm probably going to stay away from this game. Yeah, my, my instinct, JJ, I also would would like to take Seattle. I prefer Seattle. The interesting thing with Buffalo, so you tip your hat to Buffalo because they're beating all the bad teams that are on their schedule. But when they go up against a good team, and look, you know, the Jets are not a good team, so beating the Jets 23 to 20 doesn't doesn't count. I'm, I'm glad you threw that out there at the moment because yeah. they are not a good team. No, you're, you're absolutely you're right. They're two and five. They are That's not a right. good team. Not a good team. Uh, mm -hmm. Is Seattle a good team? I don't know. I don't I think know they're the average. I think Seattle is an average team. That's they what might I think be they a are. little bit better than average. I I, I don't know. Um, so that is the thing. One, one aspect, if we're going into the X's and O's a, a tiny bit, Buffalo doesn't tend to put pressure. They don't have from the from their front seven. They're not um, you know putting pressure on quarterbacks. Geno has been cooking, fellas. Geno in a clean pocket has very good numbers this season. He's in his bag, top five on both your sort of counting metrics and some advanced metrics. So um, I do like that. But if Metcalf is out, then what, what's that do to, to the handicap? How much is that worth? What's that going to do to us? I think it's a hard game for Buffalo. I do think the, the, the thing that I'm going to play for sure, no matter what, is Josh Allen to throw an interception. We are finally going to see for the first time in this NFL season a Josh Allen interception. That man's been living... Uh, a very clean life. Good job for, by you, Josh. But at one, some point, one of those turnover-worthy plays is actually going to be a turnover. So that's the only aspect of this game that I have any conviction uh, uh, with it at all, JJ. Well, boys, when we come back, we're going to focus on the teams that are near and dear to each of your respective hearts. The Niners getting ready for the Cowboys on Sunday Night Football. And for you, Mr. House, a big national showcase game against the Chicago Bears where is Mr. Daniels going to be able to give it a go and if he is not able to give it a go can Washington find a way with Mariota to beat Caleb Williams so uh, I'm going to pull on your heartstrings a little bit boys that's what we're doing when we come back next on East Coast Bias all right welcome back I, I mentioned your teams boys how so start with your team the Seawards, what a dominant performance last week against Carolina, doing it without Daniels. I, I think should make you feel that much better about where your franchise is, where your coaching staff is. I know it's Carolina, but that's what good teams do. They're going to beat up on peasants, and the Carolina Panthers are an absolute peasant. Now, you're playing at home against Chicago. Chicago's 4-2. and two, The Washington Commanders are 5-2. and two. Obviously, this line is pricing in the fact, in my opinion, that Jane Daniels probably isn't going to give it a go, right? Because I can't imagine that you would be two and a half point underdogs at home if Daniels was starting. Can your boy Mariota against a good defense house find a way? Because I almost feel the way this line is setting up, they are baiting you to just say, hey, no Daniels. Washington can't win two games in a row. Got to go and lay it with Chicago. I'm not necessarily putting this on the on the on the five I'm playing or it's not going to be a part of my card for Sunday in the ring of Sunday pregame I kind of like the commies in this spot house talk me out of it uh I'm gonna talk you out of it um, okay <laughs> it's Marcus Mariota all you need to do is watch any tape from the last five years of, of Mariota when a team is able to prepare for him he is a limited tool at this stage of his career. Wonderful guy, great mentor. I have nothing bad to say about his contribution to the team. His contribution on the football field is an entirely different matter. There is no scenario under which Jaden Daniels plays this week, notwithstanding how enticing it would be and exciting it would be. The, the C-Words have three division games coming up on their schedule. They have the Giants, then, the, then there's the Steelers, and then Dallas and Philly. 
No chance we see Jaden Daniels this coming weekend against the Bears unless there is some kind of miracle. I didn't hear that he went to Germany for any treatment, but, uh, you know, unless there's some kind of miracle treatment to get those ribs 100%, I just can't see the team risking anything having to do with him with those division games coming up. So I do think that um, the, the Bears are in an advantage position and you just sit down and do your side by side. What unit is the best unit on the football field? It's the Chicago Bears defense, which is, you know, all season long, been fast, been strong, pass rush. And if they have a chance to tee off against Marcus Mariota, I think they're going to tee off against Marcus Mariota. And I, I like them. I think the number, anything under three but feels why, right to see, me. That's my only, my, my only thing, House. Dream, how are they only giving you two and a half with the Bears here? That seems light. Okay, so when I have this game modeled with both teams at full strength, I actually have this game at a pick em. And that includes all Jalen Daniels' numbers. So you're basically moving from a pick em or maybe minus one or minus two to minus two and a half on the Bears. And this number was minus one and a half on the Bears earlier today and even yesterday. We're filming this on Wednesday for Thursday. So two and a half is a fair number. Now, I actually wish Daniels was playing because I wanted to take the Bears even before he was announced out. And the reason why is because, like how said, the Bears have the best unit on the field with their defense. Their defense is third in EPA per play. The Commanders haven't played a single defense in the top half of the league in EPA per play thus far. Bucks, week one, 22nd in EPA per play. Giants, week two, 21st in EPA per play. Bengals, 24th in EPA per play. Cardinals, 29th in EPA per play. Browns, 17th in EPA per play. Ravens, 27th in EPA per play. And the Panthers, 31st in EPA per play. So this is a big step up in class. The one caveat is the Bears do have some injuries in the secondary, Jaquan Brisker and Kyler Gordon. But I still think the Bears are going to win this game with or without Jaden Daniels. So I'm a later two and a half. You guys fairly talked me out of it. I'm just telling you right now, it seems a little ratty. And it might even find its way into the rat conversation. Because yeah. I know, Raheem, the point is going to be how much higher can you make the number? Yeah. I get that. But two and a half. But you know what, though? If this gets to three, you're going to see some sharp buy back the other way. On Washington, you're I def- agree with that. And, that's and I why definitely maybe you think you're going to have guys trying to middle this game as well. No question. Okay. Raheem, Sunday night. Your team's coming off a bye. We know the Niners have a gazillion injuries. They lost Ayuk for the year. Debo Samuel was sick. And we'll see about his status come Sunday. They kind of need him. We're going to have to wait and see what the deal with Jennings is going to be, who now has that much more significance and importance for San Francisco, knowing that Ayuk is out. They got Pearsall back. So I know the Niners are a beat-up, banged-up football team, and Purdy is coming off a terrible game. I don't need to remind you of this, though, Raheem. The narrative between the Cowboys and the Niners, it's been as lopsided and it has been as one-sided as it gets. The Niners absolutely, positively own the Dallas Cowboys. Playoff games, regular season games, you name it. Mr. Cowboy, is it going to be any different come Sunday? I can't trust this Dallas Cowboys team at all. And there's no way you can get me to back this Cowboys team. We don't have a run game. Our receivers aren't getting a ton of separation. Our defense is bad. We can't stop the run. We are actually 31st in red zone touchdown percentage. Dak Prescott has tried to throw interceptions every time we've gotten to the red zone. But the 49ers are just as bad in the red zone as well. They're 27th in red zone touchdown percentage. Oh, it was painful, Raheem, watching them against Kansas City last week. Painful, those red zone opportunities. Painful. So where do points come from? We know the 49ers are going to be able to run all over the Cowboys. We know Debo Samuel is out. We know Brandon Ayuk is out. We know Christian McCaffrey is out. They're probably going to be playing Jordan Mason and running the football. There's not going to be a ton of points. I like the under in this game. I'm not even going to bother to pick a side because I can't trust this Cowboys team, and I definitely can't lay points with the 49ers. If I had to take a side, I probably would lean towards the Cowboys coming off of a bye. But I, I just I can't trust either one of these teams. Give me the under. I like this a lot. 45 and a half is the total. And I feel like that number might sort of like like stay there or maybe even get pumped up a tiny bit because the public would by the time Monday night comes around, public doesn't play unders. Public only plays overs. And you look at those two teams, everybody's gonna you know say in their head, these are these are these teams score uh points. 
I, I wonder, Dream, let me put this in the form of a question to you. Does your handicap change if both Micah Parsons and Deron Bland are able to go? Because the early indication is like they, they might be available for Monday. Does that change your thoughts at all? Maybe it'd get me to lean towards the Cowboys, but we couldn't stop the run even with those guys out there. So it's just like it's 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 very difficult for me to, you know, come up off of that just because it's just we we can't stop the run. We haven't been able to stop the run. We gave up 200 yards rushing to the Arizona Cardinals last year. And those guys were out there and you know, we were beating everybody. We we I mean, we were in the playoffs last year. So I just I, it's not it's not going to change anything. And with these one-sided rivalries, I'm I go back to Buffalo and Miami early in the year and I was dumb enough to go the opposite way thinking it might be different. Until it is different, I'm not trying to tempt fate here. The Niners and Kyle Shanahan have absolutely owned Mike McCarthy. I, for one, am not getting cute with this game. I think it's Niners or pass. That's the way I look at it. Until the Cowboys yeah. go and play the Niners in a close game, or dare I say beat them, wake me up when it happens. Finally, AFC South battle. We hit on this on East Coast Bias on Monday with the bundle. Raheem, everything about this game says I should take Indianapolis plus the points. You mentioned the look-ahead line in week one. You mentioned a narrative of the game script in week one. That is all accurate. That is all spot on. Here's my biggest problem with taking Indianapolis in this game. I don't trust Anthony Richardson. I don't. I I watched the entire four quarters against the Miami Dolphins last week. He stunk. I mean, he's missing wide-open receivers. He's completing 45% of his passes. How? How, how is Indianapolis bringing this home is my question. I know Houston is fraudulent. I know they're not as good as their record. We know they have issues. But you see where I'm coming from with Richardson? There are serious concerns getting all those points when I need him to go and make some plays. I, I, I have my doubts on that. Richardson sucks. Like, we know this. Like, like you said, he's completing 45% of his passes. He has an off-target rate of 29.7%. And it's the highest of, like, this year. But... If there's one thing we can say is that Shane Steichen, he knows how to scheme up an offense. And Anthony Richardson, what is he good at? He's good at throwing the ball down the field. He's going to generate some explosive plays. He's boom or bust. He's the Deshaun Watson. He's the Chris Johnson of quarterbacks. And I think you could get some boom or bust plays against this Houston Texans defense. And Jonathan Taylor actually practiced today. And if he's practicing today and he's playing – that RPO with Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor is dangerous. Now, the other side of the ball is where this handicap is key because the Houston Texans offense is terrible. I know C.J. Stroud, he won rookie of the year last year. He he flashed, he dazzled. But the Texans are only 19th in offensive EPA per play and 26th in success rate. Like, you're talking Carolina Panthers territory in terms of offense. And Nico Collins is very important to the Texans offense. You like you look at Nico Collins. When he's in the lineup, when he's out of the lineup, the Texans are five and twelve straight up. So they need him. And the offense wasn't good with him. So I think the Indianapolis Colts, the look ahead line on this game, they, they played in week one, the line closed two and a half. There's no home foot advantage this year in the NFL. Like road teams are winning at an alarming rate. So this line can't be, it was six and a half, now it's down to five and a half. I know six is key. Six comes out 7% of the time. But I still would grab the five and a half, and I would also sprinkle something on the money line because the Indianapolis Colts know that this is their season. And DeForest Buckner is also practicing here. So I'm going to take the Indianapolis Colts plus five and a half. I'm also going to take some on the money line. Yeah, we're in alignment here, uh, JJ. Me and Dream see the world the same way. It's not a shock. You know, remember week one, Anthony Richardson, the starting quarterback, he had two over-the-top, drop-dead, 50-yard-plus uh, bombs that kept Indianapolis in that game as a guy who who bought the Texans minus two and a half in week one. That was my week one wise wager, not very wise. But, you know, there are some fundamentals at play here as well. These teams play each other tough as it is. The last time that anybody in this matchup beat the other by seven points or more was 2012. All these teams do is play close games. So if you're five and a half, six, this number is, to me, the the most out of whack number of the entire week. And I'm not sure exactly where where it's coming from. I also would say, um, you know, in, in terms of something up his sleeve, let's just see what Shane Steichen does 
with, with Anthony Richardson when Joe Flacco is sitting right there. Let's just see. We'll see how it goes. Dream mentioned the RPO. I better be an R and an O. We better not see very much P. Agreed. Out of Mr. Richardson. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I, 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 you know, this is an all the chip to the middle of the table because if the Colts lose this game, then their their chances of winning this division are basically done. And you know, they are live to win this division right now. It's it's them or the Texans. I, I really um, think that this is going to be a tight one, fellas. When we come back, boys, we'll wrap it up with a bang. Week 8, best bets from the East Coast Buys, boys. Before we say goodbye, week number 8, best bets. I think you guys are going to like mine. You're going to get a kick out of it. But, House, let's start with you. Well, I'm trying to do something a little inventive as well. I have the AFC least, a money line parlay. It seems like two is coming back, JJ. Like them very much on the money line. Tough spot for Arizona. You parlay that with the dreadful Jets. Yes, we said bad things about the Jets. They're all deserved, but they're going to beat the New England Patriots or else the Jets season is over. Put those two together. And then we have Christmas in October. Bryce Young is starting for the Carolina Panthers. That's a three-leg money line parlay for the Denver Broncos, the New York Jets, the Miami Dolphins, plus 140. Let's try and just build up the bankroll with some winners, fellas. Say a prayer. Okay, Dream, I have some thoughts on one of the games House gave out. It might be your best bet for me, but you, take it away. All right, I got two. I got the Denver Broncos, minus eight and a half. House mentioned Bryce Young is starting. I actually have the Carolina Panthers 16 points worse than the average team. We talked about that on the hook the other day. I'm also going to go with the Baltimore Ravens, Cleveland Browns, over 44 and a half. And this is predicated on the fact that Jameis Winston is playing. And we know the Baltimore Ravens, their offense cannot be stopped right now. Jameis Winston, he could slang it. He's going to have some turnovers. He's going to have some, some touchdowns. Something is going to happen. It's going to be action packed. So let's go with the over there. House. You knew I was going there, baby. <laughs> Prince Tua is back, and the Miami Dolphins at least now have a pulse going into these games. Take the Dolphin homerism out of it. It's a brutal spot for Arizona. They played a tight Monday night game against the Chargers, against a physical team, short week, on the road, going to the East Coast, and Miami season is on the line. They lose this game to the Arizona Cardinals. I don't care if Tua is back or not. There's nothing to discuss as far as they are concerned. They desperately need a win. I'm laying three. Don't be surprised if three and a half ends up being a number in this game. Miami, my best bet for week eight. There you go. That's going to do it for the Bias Boys, for Haas, for him, JJ. Signing off. We'll see you Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern for the Ringer Sunday pregame. Be good, everybody. <laughs>